Um, audience, I'm conflicted right now. I'm conflicted between two things. <clears throat> I'm conflicted between just going ahead and reading a speech that I've prepared, and actually the other thing is just going with the flow and reflecting on uh, many things that we see in this space. And I think that I would rather go for the second uh, option. The speech will be anyway available to you uh, for you to read. Uh, when we talk about philanthropy at an inflection point, uh, I think that uh, my thought goes to three things. Probably there are more. But I want to think first at the many inflections that we see in the global arena over the past couple of years. The first one whose impact continues to have effect on us, on our lives, on our economies, is uh, COVID-19. Uh, one of the most deadly, I think that in terms of affecting and showcasing the global vulnerability of the world, regardless whether you were a rich country or a poor country, of how, as a global community, uh, when we are not ready, when we are not building resilience, when we don't have strong systems and shared systems, how we are vulnerable as a global community and the impact it has had on lives, on economies, on vulnerability. Uh, the global economy had shrunk, if I remember correctly, globally by 2.2% GDP. In Africa was, I believe, about 1.6%. And we continue to leave that. The second one in the global arena, for me, very important that we cannot ignore, is the war in Europe. And what a wake-up call it has given us as Africans. And I think that even more recently, we have seen the withdrawal of Russia from the grain agreement, uh, the big concern it has brought to the world, but more importantly in Africa. The wake-up call it gave us is also um, the threats on our own ability uh, to feed ourselves. It has brought, I think, or reaffirmed a new paradigm. We have talked mostly in the world about food security. But this change and big change in the world takes us to speak no more just about food security, but about food sovereignty. And it makes us reflect as a continent uh, with uh, 30 million square kilometers, 1.3 or 4 billion people, the most useful continent, how we can depend on the agricultural production of two countries that probably are not this together, maybe, maybe the size of DRC or, or, or something. So that's a big, uh, I think, change that uh, we see. And also the situation of capital as well, as induced by that. And how uh, capital has been mostly more uh, channeled toward addressing the impacts of these issues in the countries where most philanthropic, global philanthropic money was coming from and coming into Africa and uh, raises the importance of us banking on our own selves uh, even more. So I think those are really important points at the global, at the global level. In Africa, 
we can see the issues around democracy. We can agree that our continent for many years has been on a trajectory of increasing uh, democracy. But what we are seeing in West Africa, largely due to economic crisis these days, actually calls uh, for attention uh, to us. I remember in the late 90s, when you looked at the map of uh, West Africa, you would see that every head of state uh, was either a military or a former military that came to power through unconstitutional change. And we have seen a lot of change over the past 15, 20 years, whereby we could see almost every country led by an elected head of state. But over the past three years, it looks like we are going backwards. And what does that mean in terms of democracy and where we focus our resources as countries uh, to address the challenges or empower our people to address the challenges they face? I think it's a big change. We're seeing also the impact of that shrinking space for civil society and also big population growth faster than the economic growth, the vulnerability in which it has put our youth, the most useful uh, continent. By 20, uh, 2050, only the youth segment between 18 and 24 will double to 400 million. What does that mean? And we've seen these days many young people dying in the Mediterranean and Atlantic, losing faith in the ability of our continents to secure a future for them, and today ready uh, to, 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 to perish. What does that mean, and what does that mean for African, African philanthropy? And I think, if I think that philanthropy is the grease that oils the wheel of progress in society, then I think that it is important for us to look at also what are the inflection points that we see in philanthropy, and in particular in African philanthropy, and which we need to address or take advantage of for philanthropy to hold that promise to support transformation of society. And some of them I will just list, not comprehensive, but I think very important. It's a very changing landscape. We see many family foundations joining the movement. We also see many high net worth individuals coming in, instituting uh, foundations. There is a lot of hype, by the way. We see also a growing uh, number of what I could call the dot-com, but probably, I would probably say corporate foundations coming. Today we are seeing a change, a very interesting change in the space. What used to be called as a RSE, Responsabilité Societal and Environmental, today is, is changing to become more corporate foundations, repackaged in that way, but not necessarily focusing on inclusive economies, but actually using philanthropy to actually buy a license to operate. So this is also an important change that we need to, to see. So if we think again on the hypothesis uh, that philanthropy has the power because 
unlike governments. Its decisions do not depend on the potential outcome of the next election. Or unlike corporates, its decisions and investments is not based on the potential quarterly or half yearly uh, earnings and how that supports that. Then we have a unique power, a unique opportunity to have the freedom to do what matters. But it is important also to understand that regardless of the resources available to us as philanthropic groups, what we have is never enough and it's just as a drop in the ocean of needs. So the idea of leverage becomes even more important in the midst of all those changes that I have talked about. And I think that uh, you have really given four themes to look at and to concentrate on and to reflect on as a group, which are people, power, practice, and policy, to have that impact that we are foreseeing. Let me share my thoughts about each of them. When I think about people in this context and in our community, I really think about skills, knowledge. To really foster innovation, and innovation not being just disruptive change, but taking proven solutions that have brought fruits, applying them into new problems, new places, new contexts. To do that, we need knowledge and we need skills. We need a knowledge society. And this means that we need to increase investment uh, in people. And when I say people, it's not people out there. It's first and foremost people within the philanthropic sector. Because to have the fruits that we want, and I think this is very easy to understand. I always say to have a good plant, you need two things. You need a very good seed, and you need a fertile soil. Think about the good seed as the competent, the knowledgeable, and the skillful uh, people coming also with all the other soft skills such as leadership, accountability, readiness to serve, uh, what that means for us. And I think that this is something that is extremely important that we today actually as a community think about how do we invest in ourselves actually to really up the game and bring the kind of knowledge and skills in sectors, emerging sectors that we don't have in the community. I think it is extremely important, perhaps for some of these organizations here, to undertake an inquiry, a study, and to look at the challenges that we face today, the upcoming challenges in the rapidly digitizing world. Are we, as a philanthropic community, endowed and have within our organizations all the skills that we need to be able to face uh, that, that challenge? And obviously, it's not there. But I cannot talk about people without talking about institutions. Because I talked about two things. Obviously, good seed, fertile soil. Fertile soil, for me, are institutions. And we should ask ourselves today, if we look back, to say, do we have today the right institutions, those institutions that are ready and able to tackle the challenges of today and the challenges of tomorrow. 
I think that many of us will be tempted to say no. Then what does that mean? What those institutions should look like? What are the transformations, the ways of working, and this speaks to the problem of practice that needs to take place to be able to have uh, those two conditions. And I always say those two conditions are not enough if we are not, as a philanthropic community also, not looking at that mindset change in terms of our role and our responsibility. And we know there are challenges around financing and other things, but our ingenuity and our change of perspective and mindset is going to make that difference. It's very interesting, many of you would be surprised if I said, actually, crops don't need rain. But it's true, crops don't need rain. Crops need water. It's all about perspective. We often see in Africa farmers sitting next to a water stream and complaining that it has not rained yet. And think about that in our own context. And that's the kind of change of perspective and change of mindset that I'm talking about. The second point is about power. In my perspective, I think that when we talk about power, it's really about the balance of giving and recipients. And how do we change that narrative that we are helping and supporting people transform their lives without making them a dependable, uh, 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 too much dependent? And what does that mean into our upward and our downward accountability towards them? Not that just us thinking about what is nice, what are the good solutions to them, but how do we genuinely make them and bring them as part of the solution? And prioritizing that. And to me, that's about the power. And to me, the power also speaks to private sector. Uh, I said earlier, because of the imperatives of the next quarterly earnings limits the ability oftentimes of uh, private sector in investing in untested solutions. We have seen it and seen it again. But here is an important role that actually philanthropy can play. Because we can fail, we can learn. But we can invest in those new untested ideas. And not doing it just because it's cool, but we believe that because when it works and there is a proven business case, there is someone, there is a market for it. And there is someone who will be willing to invest in that solution and take it to scale. That's also about in the power of philanthropy. And again, this can only be done if we operate that change of mindset that I've been talking about. I want to talk briefly about practice. It feels to me, and uh, obviously I think that uh, CAPSI and perhaps many other organizations like CAPSI can also do some inquiry about that. Yes, it is a growing community of philanthropy in Africa. Uh, we have many platforms, some of them are here. But I believe that we are, and evidence, more evidence needs to be brought to that. But I think that we are together without truly always being together in addressing the key challenges that we face. Mutualizing our efforts, mutualizing our knowledge, mutualizing our influence, mutualizing our resources to tackle big problems. 
And this will require, actually, for many of us to just move away or do less and put less attention on the issue of putting cool stories on our website, but really looking at how we can build a common narrative as a community and showcase how we can address and tackle a big problem. And I will give you an example that I have been an actor of. A few years back, I think now probably seven years, as I was uh, heading Rockefeller Foundation and investing importantly, significantly in agriculture, I realized that many of our colleagues actually, we were funding the same actors for the same uh, goals but we were measuring outcomes differently. Our work was not coordinated. At the end of the day, the organizations, African organizations we were funding and supporting were very busy satisfying our individual organizational desiderata than actually focusing on the real problem of transformation of African agriculture. And this is many times the case in this space. What we did was call a few of them and say, let's sit down and look at this issue and see how we can coordinate our work. At the time, we, bring, we brought in Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, ourselves Rockefeller Foundation. We brought in USAID, and we sat down and said, actually, how do our objectives compare? And we realized that we were pursuing the same type of outcomes. And we said, can we agree to have a common results measurement framework? Can we agree to put our resources together and empower one organization, which was AGRA, with very solid goals in many countries with big numbers uh, to reach? And that's what we did. Gates put in $200 million for five years. We, Rockefeller, put in $50 million. USAID put $90 million. And that started the program. We were coordinating and having only one meeting with all these stakeholders with AGRA. So there was less pressure, more resources for AGRA to actually focus on the development outcomes. Along the line, many other joined. GIZ joined with 30 million euros. UK joined with another 50 million uh, pounds, etc., etc. And this has given the biggest one philanthropic, actually, budget for agriculture transformation to a single program over $700 million just for five years. And I think it is possible. We need to come together to mutualize our resources for big problems. We all do great work here and there, transform the lives of one or two or three people, small communities. But the issues of scale of impact is a big problem. And that issue of scale of impact cannot be resolved if we do not come, come together on joint programs, joint goals, joint ways of uh, measuring our impact, and also telling the story of not institutions, but telling the story of a group of institutions making change. And finally, that's to me about what we can look at in practice. The other thing is about really being ruthless about measuring and showcasing our impact. Today we must admit it. The policy space or regulatory space 
is still not as incentivizing on our continent, although there are differences between the, uh, from country to country, is still not very favorable uh, to the strengthening of, of philanthropy. Sometimes we even see the contrary. I'll come here again with a story, and I think that my brother Akwasi here will remember that. A few years back, I think this is, we are talking here about 2010 or 2009, here in Senegal. The government decided actually to revoke the registration of all uh, international development organizations. And each and every one had to go back and register individually. And we see many of such things happening in different places. And I remember we met at Oxfam, at our offices, brought everyone to have a discussion and say, OK, we have all received individual letters, but can we sit together and discuss about this issue and see how we can co-strategize to address this? And I remember there was somebody who said, OK, but we need to make this issue also public so that we can garner the support of our beneficiaries. And I remember, I, and I think this was Brother, Brother Akwasi in his wisdom who said, do we have evidence that if we put this in the public, we will be supported by the public? What do we think about how the public is seeing us beyond just the beneficiaries of our work in remote rural villages? How are we seen in town? Are we seen as the big guys in four by four cars flying from a place to place, etc.? Would it be more positive support or negative support to us? And to me, I am telling this story because this tells about our, the issue of our accountability to everyone. Because of the nature of how we are funded as philanthropic organizations, we don't feel the pressure to account on what we do, and especially to the broad public. And I think that occurrence, that issue, showed if it was needed more than ever the importance not just to account to the people you fund you or the people that you work with directly, but also the importance of your accountability worldwide to society, more globally. And I think this is something that is extremely important we need to look at and consider in our practice. And the last point I will talk about, because I'm conscious of time, is the issue of policy. Extremely important. Policy, and I say regulation. I want to add regulation. Because I believe that uh, the first step in policy implementation is regulation. And we think that we have an important role uh, to play also in this space. Because policy is best done when it is evidence-based. It is evidence comes from where? Evidence comes from two places, perhaps at least, but probably much many more. One is research. How are we as a community supporting the generation of knowledge through society? Working with academics, working with think tanks. Today, we at ACBF support the Africa Think Tank Network, a network of 60 think tanks. But today, the biggest challenge of these think tanks are their funding and their sustainability. How, what role can we play to support them to conduct the research and generate the knowledge, the evidence, and the insights that private sector actors need, that policymakers need 
actually to devise uh, the conducive policies. And I think this is very important. And to make it demand driven as well. And I think we have a very important role that we can play with there. The second area is, to me, evidence comes from practice, from our work, from the programs that we develop, the programs that we implement, the programs that we evaluate but not just evaluate whether we have done it or not done it, what are the numbers, but really looking at very deeply in terms of the outcomes and the impact and how this is changing the lives of people. And what are the lessons that we are learning from that and how we disseminate those lessons and put them in the hands of those who make policy. I think there is an extremely important role that philanthropy uh, can play uh, in, in that. Uh, but it is also the issue of data. Last year, in partnership with data.org and uh, the MacJ Govern Foundation, we released a, a report on data talent in the social sector. What we realize is that there is a huge shortage of data scientists, data miners, actually in the social sector. When we say social sector, this means government, and this means philanthropic organizations, this means civil society organizations. And what does that suggest? That suggests that probably most of programs, development programs that are being developed are not based on real and strong evidence. Because not only we don't have the data, but also we don't have the capacity to mine it and to make the data speak and provide that evidence. So I think that it is extremely important for us and this links to my first point about people, is really how we can invest in building that capability, in increasing data talent for our sector, so that the decisions, investment decisions, are not based on our just goodwill, or what we see cool and nice here and there, but we have the right evidence, the right data, that guide that decision decision making. I cannot uh, finish without telling a little bit about the African Capacity Building Foundation and the role we can play in this. ACBF uh, has been created 30 years, 32 years ago in 1991, in the midst of structural adjustments uh, in Africa because at the time there were 12 states that received the massive funding from the World Bank, the African Development Bank, UNDP and others to support these structural adjustment programs. But things were not moving. Countries were having challenges actually using the resources. The burn rate was very low and at the end of programs significant amount of those resources were being returned. And that's in that context that ACBF was created, understanding that it's not just about an issue of money, but it is also an issue of capacity. Capacity to plan, capacity to execute. Over time, uh, ACBF has trained over 50,000 civil servants, Many of them today hold high offices in their government, ministers, government, governors of central banks, and all of that, what have you, are there. But also supported policy, uh, evidence-based policy making through the creation of uh, several think tanks. Many of them are known today here. Uh, I think that our friends from Kenya would be familiar with Kipra um, or Kadert or even here in Senegal support, there are, there are many today with very uneven uh, influence. 
because it again depends on the appetite of policymakers on evidence and, 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 and knowledge. But by and large, many of them today are there. So we continue to play in our new strategy 2023-2027 uh, to do and implement the same mission and mandate that was created 32 years ago, is to continue to build human capital through skills, but also to build institutions. And this brings back to my statement in the beginning, because those two are intimately linked. So we provide uh, uh, skills through the ACBF Academy, and the ACBF Academy is launching this year two big schools that are extremely important to address the issues of shortages. The first one is the African School of Taxation and Public Administration. To address the issue and build the capacity for increased resource mobilization on the continent, and while also improving public finance management, not through technical skills, but through soft skills, such as transformative leadership, accountability, inclusivity, purpose-driven uh, budgeting PFM. By the way, in this space, civil society is far more advanced than our public, our public sector, because just the civil servants are not wired that way to be open and accountable to citizens. So this is why we are not focusing on technical skills, but more on, on the soft skills. The second school that we are launching in the beginning of 2024 is the African School of Regulation. As I said earlier, regulatory regulation is the first step in policy implementation, and we drastically lack regulatory capacity on our continent. What we do on the continent in terms of regulation is more compliance to others' regulations, but not our own regulation. There are so many sectors that are not regulated at all. And there is important to, to change that. But it's also through the institutional accelerator. And the institutional accelerator is a tool that allows to look at any organization and analyze, do an assessment on 10 big parameters, going from governance to, to, to talent, to systems, to processes, to fundraising, to results man, uh, measurement, etc., and identify strong points, weaknesses of that organization and coming up with a capacity development uh, plan. High touch, medium touch, low touch. Do, and this is cognizance that if you build the skills but do not have the right conducive institutions, then impact can be jeopardized. So this is what ACBF offers as part of this community. And we are already doing that for many, several foundations, unfortunately mostly funded by foreign foundations. But I pledge this to this community to see how we can work together to really strengthen our organizations and improve and increase their ability to make an impact. It's been long, but I hope with some of those, I hope thought provoking, nothing new, but just putting the finger on issues that I think that if we don't address, our impact will continue to be limited. Thank you for your attention. and for allowing me to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.